Thanks very much, uh, and again, thanks for the invitation to come and speak, and apologies for having arrived uh, a little bit late. For some reason, the bus service on the south side is, is worse than a Sunday today, so sorry about that. I think uh, I'd like to begin by breaking down <coughs> some of the, the questions which anybody has to face if, if they want to determine what their position is going to be on something like private placement, and most of them have been touched on. There's the moral argument. The idea that these weapons, weapons of mass destruction, are just wrong, just plain morally wrong. And we've made that case, many of us, for, for many, many years. I think the first political memory I've got is of being taken along when I was about yay high to a CND demo. Mm. Uh, you know, generations before me as well have made this, this moral argument, and there weren't enough of us. We didn't win. Uh, on strength of numbers, the, the number of people for whom that moral argument sealed uh, and settled the question, there weren't enough of us. There's the economic question. Is it a good use of money? And, you know, at all of those demos in many, many sense, we can all remember passionate speeches about how, how dare we not pay the nurses? How dare we not pay the teachers? How can we be cutting public services when we're spending all this money? And yes, absolutely. It's a huge amount of money. It's anything that we didn't spend on Triton, we could spend on things that mattered more to us. And yet we've been making that case for many, many years as well, and it wasn't enough. And it's kind of understandable that that argument on its own wasn't enough. I suspect everybody in this room is someone for whom all of these arguments have been settled for many, many years. If we happened to be a room full of people who genuinely thought we needed these weapons, we would think it was important to find the money. And so you move on to the question of need, strategic questions. Is this a weapon that we need? And I think this is where the balance starts to tip. The number of people who can be convinced to agree with the position against renewal for scrapping crime, the number starts to approach uh, the, the, the kind of area where we might win the argument of finding add together the people for whom the moral case matters, add together the people for whom the economic case is enough. The question of need, the question of strategic need, is hugely important. And, you know, several, I think pretty much everyone who's spoken has alluded to the idea that this was a weapon that convinced some people to want it in previous generations, but those same people might be open to being convinced that it's no longer relevant. And then you come on to the diplomatic argument. The di diplomatic argument, the people who've moved from a, a position of unilateral disarmament and will tell a story about how they changed their thinking and decided that ultimately multilateral disarmament was the right way to go. And that, that's a, a, a diplomatic process. Uh, and that uh, on that position they might want to, to retain uh, the, the weapon as a bargaining chip in that multilateral process. And even that no longer stacks up when you come to think about replacement, because replacement, in any terms, is not disarmament. It's unilateral rearmament. And the opportunity that we have at a time when a decision is being made about renewal or replacement, the opportunity we have is to challenge those who've had this conversion, who used to be in favour of unilateral disarmament, eventually came to a position of multilateral disarmament. Now we've got an opportunity to ask them to reevaluate that. And if we can add in those people, uh, we've got the, the real opportunity for uh, hopefully a majority. But there's another argument as well, there's another case, another question which determines many people's position. It determines many newspapers' positions, and we all know how influential they are with governments of any kind. And it, it determines many politicians' positions on this question. And it's emotional. It's about status. And I think Bill uh, Butler alluded to it when he talked, was it, was it you, Bill? It was one of the bills, I think, anyway, who talked about whether Britain would ever give up the nuclear weapon system while France still had it. I forget which bill it was, whichever one of you. <laughs> You know, that's about status. That's about the status symbol. That's about how big a country, how important a country are we if we've got these weapons. 
So Humphrey was, was honest and open about that argument, and yes, Prime Minister, if you remember, but I think he's about the only person I can remember being genuinely open and honest about the fact that as a status symbol, it, it has some, uh, some importance. And whether people think that matters also helps to determine their, their position on the question of whether we should retain or replace Trident. I want to say that on each of these five questions, we've got opportunities right now that I don't think we had before the election. Not massive, groundbreaking, transformational opportunities, small opportunities, but we need to make sure that we exploit them all uh, if, we, if we're going to have any progress at all. The, the leadership debates, which were in so many ways tawdry and nauseating to me personally, they did give a level of public awareness to the question that I can't remember happening for quite some time. A, a political television program with that level of audience actually telling people that there's a question right now about Trident replacement. Actually saying that to people. I think there are far more people in the UK who are after this election who are aware that this decision is about to be made and who are aware that there's a defence review that could include or not include Trident. And we need to be speaking to them. Those of us who have a case to make need to be speaking to those people who are newly aware of that. Particularly younger voters who, who may never even have been, uh, had this question addressed to them before. I think on the, uh, on the, the, the political arguments, you know, I'm, I'm bound to say that the the new MP for Brighton Pavilion uh, is going to be an ally on this. Not just one more voice. I, I can assure uh, Robert that she's not going to be in the least bit sundry, uh, Caroline Lucas as the, as the new MP. Also someone, a political party that's stood for election on an explicitly unilateral disarmament ticket, arguing the case on moral grounds as well as strategic and, and, uh, and economic grounds and others. And so there are opportunities to make sure that we're adding all of the voices within Parliament together and, and speaking not just within the laws of Parliament but outside to, to all of those other people who may be ready to hear these arguments sometimes and, uh, you know, again and sometimes for the first time to hear those arguments. And finally, the last thing I want to say is about the new government and um, you know, I, can, I can promise uh, Robert and, and other, other colleagues from the Liberal Democrats that in other occasions I will be scathing. On other occasions I will be extremely critical and have been already of the new uh, coalition. But I think that from the point of view of, of this conference and this issue, we need to think about the opportunities, even if they are small, that could come from this. Having ministers in government, including uh, as, as defence ministers or, or uh, the armed forces minister, who said things like the, the quote that we saw on the screen there, it's not a promise, it's not a guarantee of, prom, of progress by any means, but it is the, possi the small possibility that he will be able to work with, for example, those in the military who want to make the strategic case against Trident and he will find ways to strengthen their hand. As, as I say, you know, my, my kind of political instinct is to be hands up in horror and angry and, and a lot of the time I have been. But really, if we want to see any progress at all on this issue over the next couple of years, we need to seize on any opportunity, however small. And if, if big, big if, uh, a few voices within the new government are able to manipulate or to move behind the scenes in ways that can be helpful to those of us outside government who want to make the case, case more explicitly and publicly, then perhaps there's a small opportunity. So I think I, I want to hope uh, that we can come out of this conference feeling that there's, there's at least some small grades of opportunity out there and that if we don't seize them and try and work with them uh, in as creative a way as we can, we will lose them. So let's, let's try and jump on them as quickly as possible. Thank you.